Okay, we're back. We're live. It's the four o'clock block. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm Jay Fidel, a host. Uh, our, our, I'm, I'm your host, and our show is called Honolulu: A Tale of Two Worlds at the Crossroads of the Pacific. We're going to talk about the fact that Hawaii can no longer rely on federal government spending in Washington. And our guest for the show, I guess our co-host in China, um, in Beijing, is Russell Liu. So Hawaii is facing a crisis. In a Trump presidency, Hawaii can no longer rely on federal government spending. With the internet, global opportunities and tourism are being missed as Chinese travelers find other competitive leisure destinations. And with the internet, business investments also are passing overhead for Hawaii. Crisis develops opportunities. So there may be opportunities here for Hawaii. What must Hawaii do? Welcome to the show, Russell Liu, and welcome Lee Tian Yu, and welcome William Ladd. Russell, would you introduce our guests in Beijing? Yes, uh, good morning, Jay. Good morning, our fellow Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiians out there. I'd like to introduce two special guests this morning. I have Lee Tian Yu, who goes by the name Irene Lee, and William Ladd, who incidentally is from Hawaii. And both of them are students here in Beijing Foreign Studies University. Ms. Lee is a majoring in law, which is an undergraduate curriculum. And uh, Bill is majoring in international business, and he's in his third year of business school here. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about what this all means. I mean, we, uh, Hawaii has to do something. Hawaii cannot expect to receive the same government funding as it has before. Tourism is a great solution. Hawaii has not, in my view, and I think in your view also, Russell, uh, Hawaii has not really attended to cultivating and developing tourism from China. Uh, so what's missing from the recipe and what can we do now to make it better? Well, we have two guests here today. We're going to talk about something very important, and uh, it's about global education, uh, global learning, understanding cultures where this opens opportunities uh, to global business. And this is something sorely missed in Hawaii and the United States. And first I'm going to ask a question of, of Bill Ladd here who's from Hawaii, uh, and he's going to display his experiences uh, when he first got here and what kind of doors have opened up here uh, that he foresees in the future. Uh, Bill, why don't you tell me, how did you get here? Sure. Well, I was born and raised in Hawaii. I went to HBA and later Punahou School. Um, however, in 2008, when my father was flying for Aloha Airlines, um, Aloha Airlines went out of business, went bankrupt, and so my family needed to seek for new opportunities elsewhere. Um, and we landed in China. We went to Shenzhen, China, and my father started flying for Shenzhen Airlines. Um, it was at that point that our journey into China really began. And when we first got here, we didn't know any Mandarin. So I figured since I was the young man of the family, I needed to go out and do my best and take advantage of this opportunity. And so that's what I did. I did my best to learn Mandarin, and here I am now, 2017, at Bay Wife. So All right, that's question, standing. Bill. Um, are there many American students here in a Chinese university studying business? Uh, not so many. Um, I just know one other person, a man from Seattle. And so, where are most of the students from? Um, you're studying international global business. Where are they from? Most students are actually from Africa, Europe, Latin America, Russia, Central Asia, places like that. We don't really have many American students. So, so that's very interesting. Not many American students. But tell me about how do you converse with students from Africa and Europe if they don't speak English? Actually, that's a rather commonplace occurrence. A lot of these students, when they come here, their English is not, not really at a comfortable level for them. And the lingua franca here, when that doesn't happen, is Mandarin Chinese. And that happens on a daily basis. And, and that's my experience, too, coming here. Uh, when I meet lawyers and judges from Africa, uh, Central America, uh, Europe, and Korea, I end up speaking Mandarin. That's how we converse. Uh, so it's, it's interesting how language is, is used here. Tell us, how do you foresee that opening opportunities for you? Well, not only can language just make you friends, in the sense that just by saying hello to people in their own language, 
that really gets a smile out of them and makes them trust you all that bit more. But it can also open the way for business opportunities. Starting with friendship, you can then move on to business networks, and those business networks can extend across the globe. So that, that means global business. And, and I'll turn the question to Ms. Irene Lee. So Irene, what do you study here at, at, at BFCU, Beijing Foreign Studies University? Um, I'm actually currently studying like double major degree. It's English and law at the same time. And so how old are you, uh, Irene? You are, you are 19 years old. And so have you studied red American Cases. Do you study American law? Yeah, we have towards law and uh, towards contracts and um, the introduction to common law right here. Like normally, it's like two, uh, one or two courses every semester in the U.S. system, and we have learned so many famous cases such as Roe v. Wade and the Paul's Graph case. Which tell me about Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. Um, because here, um, abortion is not that big of an issue here, but it really broadens our like our horizon and makes really uh, shed us the light shed light on us that um, whether it's pro life or pro choice, whether women have the freedom to choose whether she's going to have an abortion or not. So that's fantastic. I'm hearing from a Chinese student who is not even in a U.S. law school and undergraduate law course being able to talk and analyze like a Western person. So so it's very interesting. And speaking about being global, you speak English very well. Tell me how you learned English. Um, like everybody else here, I started learning English from like ever since elementary school. But I don't know, I just, ever since I was a little child, I really loved learning languages. And I think the secret of learning English well is not to um, just take it like for the test. I think I really enjoy speaking English all the time to talking to different people from all around the world. I think that's what got me here today. And let me ask this question both of you. True or false? Chinese young people travel abroad. Yeah, definitely yes. And and do you see that as a as a, a very significant trend that where have you gone to travel? You're nineteen years old. Mm -hmm. And where have you visited? What countries? Um, I've been to Hawaii and Israel and Thailand. Fantastic. And, and Israel, why did you go to Israel? Uh, I went to Israel because I, back in high school we had this opportunity of an exchange program. So that's I signed up, got enrolled, and that's why I went to Israel. And so, so when you got to travel abroad, did you get a chance and opportunity to use your English? Yeah, of course, because we don't speak Hebrew, so the only way we can communicate with those host families and the Israeli students is through English. So I see a common th uh, th uh, thing here, where through language, you're able to communicate, you're able to go to another culture, you're yeah. able to do business, you're able to communicate. Yeah. And so, so is that something that's going to be important in your future, English and Chinese? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in my case, it's not just important, it's essential. Because of my Mandarin skills, I was able to land an internship at the World Bank. And in that time, I utilized my knowledge of finance, as well as my knowledge of Mandarin, uh, to study climate change finance and try to help China overcome the pollution issue. Well, that's fantastic, because when I went to school in, 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 in the U.S. college, I never had those opportunities. So I see that in today's world, we are much more integrated globally, and you need to have a certain skill. So, and so I see the skill as being language. Absolutely. And, and tell me something. I, I'm just curious for our audience. We're curious about Chinese students. I mean, mm -hmm. Tell us, true or false? Mm -hmm. Chinese study, students study harder than U.S. students. Sure. True. Yes. Well, true. Absolutely. How many hours a day do you study? Um, normally, I have six to eight hours of classes each day. And besides the classes, I also have assignments for each and every subject. So, how many courses do you take in a semester? Um, this semester is pretty heavy loaded, and for me, I take 16 courses every week. 16 courses every week, my God. And, and each course lasts two hours. And Will, how about you? I take six to eight courses a week. Okay, I'm just curious now, um, in terms of the language capability, um, what do you see uh, as the advantage, Will, of learning language and someday you plan to go back to the U.S.? 
absolutely. I want to return to Hawaii as soon as I can. I miss it. Um, but one thing that could really help Hawaii is learning Mandarin. Mandarin of all languages opens the door to one-seventh of the world's population. And for example, Shenzhen, where I first moved to in China, has five million people. That's five times the state of Hawaii, all in one city. And just by speaking their language, you can open doors to new friends and business relationships. And, and let me add to that. It's, it's, a, it's a big phenomenon because Chinese students are, are going abroad to study. Uh, in 2014 alone, over 300,000 students went abroad to the U.S., pumped in $10 billion in the economy. For example, the small Iowa City was a, was a recipient of $10 million uh, because of, of students just going to that city, just alone to study. Imagine what it can do for other places like Hawaii, for example. And alone in 2016, we had over half a million Chinese students going abroad to two places, the United States and the UK. So it's, it's, it's a fantastic uh, opportunities for uh, the U.S. Jay, do you have any questions to ask? Yeah, I, no, absolutely. I have many I'm questions so much, to ask. But so uh, I just want you know, you guys uh, have, you're there over the last couple of years. Uh, you're in school. You're observing, um, you know, the way China is moving. And everyone knows, uh, Russell can tell you, um, that China is moving faster all the time. And, and you know, it's not, it's not really directly related to its economy. The fact is that China is becoming more global. I think we're going to find that out in the meeting between Xi Jinping and Donald uh, Trump. Uh, gee, in a few days, we're going to find out how very sophisticated China is about global development and uh, exerting in increasing global influence uh, on many, many places in the world. So where do you see it going for you? In your case, Irene, you're studying law. You've seen other, you know, other countries. Um, you've seen the development of the rule of law to such a, to a certain extent in China. Um, and for you, um, Will, um, you, you know, you come from Hawaii. You understand the relationship of a little wee place like Hawaii and Asia Pacific and a huge place like China. Um, and you're studying international relations. So I guess my question is, you know, um, we, we have a confluence. We have an intersection. We have, a, we have China becoming more internationally oriented, and we have Hawaii, which you know, may or may not have an international view of the world. And, and what is that intersection like for you? How do you see China developing? How do you see Hawaii developing? How do you see yourself developing at the intersection where maybe you could help um, you know, participate in the connection? OK, let's, let's talk to you, Irene, first. So for me, I think um, it's getting it's starting to get become a trend that so many Chinese students are studying abroad in the U.S. and yeah, like we re we really value the education there and um, yeah, we, we, we and we really love to learn about the U.S. culture and I think it's U.S. and China is getting more and more integrated and yeah, we we are like more and more like westernized. Western us somehow, and I think it's a really great opportunity for Chinese to actually see the outside world, to break the stereotypes, to break the, the, the shackles that is like from the, the old society, and yeah, it really broadens up the horizon of the people here and brings so much opportunities. I think. Yeah, what can so, what can uh, China do for Hawaii, and what can Hawaii do for China, Irene, and what can you do to make that happen? How changed why? Um, I think there are so many like communications, so many business going on. For example, um, I went to Hawaii on a um, debate tournament, which the uh, the HPU invited us to participate in. And I think, yeah, being in a place is so much different than learning about some place on a textbook or on a video or by interviewing a person because getting like immersed in the environment breaks so many stereotypes and. It just sheds so much light on you that this place is like how this place really is, and for me, like being in Hawaii, really, it like, yeah, it's really like broadens my experience in life and really, yeah, makes yeah makes me really understand the local culture there. And I think 
like there's there are like similar cases going on nowadays. I, I, like many of my friends, they have exchange programs like in U, in the U.S. Also Hawaii included, and I think yeah, that's a really a game changer for everyone here. So yeah. so what I see, I read what you're saying is just the actual face to face meeting of cultures can slowly um, change a place, change perceptions, yeah. and make people want to engage each other yeah. socially, yeah. business wise. And, and so it seems to me, and I'm going to toss that question now to Will, uh, uh, and, and because he's from Hawaii, so maybe he can give a, another thought to fellow Hawaiians how language changes and understanding culture changes things. He can create a foundation for business. Sure. Well, on that note, um, being from Hawaii and proud of it, you know, in Hawaii, we, a lot of people come over there for tourism. and we do have the most beautiful area in the world, and we should be proud of that. But one way we could really take advantage of our historical Western and Eastern relationship in the fact that we are the crossroads between the two civilizations, we can take advantage of that by learning the language. And if we learn the language, we can start to provide this business environment, not just tourist environment, to the expanding Chinese economy which needs to go outside and invest. And as we heard from Irene, the Chinese love the U.S. They want to invest in the U.S. So why not give them that portal, give them that doorway in Hawaii by learning their language and making it even more attractive for Chinese investors? So it sounds like what Hong Kong did for the Westerners to be the portal to get into China in the early years, how they benefited by being the port of the gatekeeper. So it seems to me, Jay, that what I'm hearing is through language, we need to build a foundation, infrastructure, when we have a lot of language, understand Russell, culture. that's easier said than done, isn't it? I mean, it's not easy to, uh, you know, learn uh, Mandarin. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I commend you, uh, Will, on, on your language skills. By the way, Irene, I commend you on your language skills also. <laughs> You're very good on English. You're very good with English. In any event, um, you know, take the average young person in Hawaii. <clears throat> he has not been in an international business school. <clears throat> the likelihood is he has not traveled not only to China, but he has not traveled to Asia. And you would like him to learn Mandarin. Uh, will he do that? How would he do that? Uh, how will you encourage him to do that? How should the government encourage him? How should Russell encourage him to do that? It isn't easy to learn Mandarin. Shui Dao Chu Chung. I will just answer. At the age of an old age, the middle age, I came here. I didn't have no language, no culture, no friends, no family. I perished in Beijing. And it's been a 14 year honeymoon. Uh, I can go to the uh, grocery store. I can speak Chinese on a daily level. I can buy my groceries. I can function in society. I can bargain in Chinese. So I say it can be done. But I'm going to ask Will the question this, because Will may be not so much in tune with Hawaii News. But Will, what do you think about this? There's a school in Hawaii called Marino that is now starting an immersion program in Mandarin from kindergarten to second grade. What do you think about that? That's great. That's the way to do it. Because you know what? When I was coming here, I was only 15. I felt that if I learned some Mandarin in Hawaii, that would have made the process that much simpler. Because when I came here, I only knew Spanish and Latin from Punahou. But when you started learning uh, Mandarin, did it open other portals to you, uh, learn other languages? Absolutely. I mean, learning Mandarin and after, being, after learning how to write, um, the traditional characters that are used in Chinese were also used by the Japanese that were brought over during the Tang Dynasty. So I can read the kanji of Japanese. Um, you know, Russell, I have a, uh, I have a, I have a god uh, son who married a Filipino woman from Hong Kong. And they had um, some kids, and they live in Portland now, although he has a business in Hong Kong. And uh, this Filipino woman decided that she wanted her children to learn Mandarin. And there was no place in Portland where they could do that. So she got some money, I guess federal money, state money, and she created a charter school. And the charter school uh, is built around an immersion course in Mandarin. 
and you have kids there in Portland, Oregon, doing immersion, and they're not necessarily Chinese now. They all oh, hapa hapa all that. Um, they they are learning Mandarin in Portland in an immersion course, and I agree with you, Will, that immersion and and every, uh, that immersion is the best way to learn any foreign language, but especially Mandarin. You have to do it all day. And the question I put to you is, how do we achieve that in Hawaii? Because I don't think we'll be able to enjoy this international connection, this international opportunity. I agree with you, unless we speak Mandarin. How do you create an immersion course in Hawaii? Outside of Punahou, outside of HPA, outside of Iolani, in the ordinary course for the ordinary student. How do we do that? Well, let me ask Will this question, because um, we said we accept Marin, we accept Yolani, we accept Punahou, but there's a new trend happening. One school starts and other schools start to find a different way to do it. Marin was starting with an immersion program, Cato second grade. And I just learned Iolani is, is building a new campus for international students, trying to attract Chinese students. What do you think about that, Chinese students coming to the Hawaii? Beautiful idea. As you said, sir, immersion is the best way, and that's how I learned Mandarin. So applying that to Hawaii through Chinese students is the perfect way to do it. That provides the immersion and the environment as best as you can get. But keep in mind, it also requires individual effort on the student, as well as their families, to try and encourage that sort of growth in language learning capacity. So it's all, also, we talked about exchanges, and Irene, you've learned English. Um, by by immersing yourself in culture, so so what did you do in China? How did you become so uh, conversant in English, and so fluent? Um, I have so many foreign friends, like from all around the world, and we communicate in English. And also, the, uh, when I went to Israel, like I was so astonished that so many of the Israeli kids they can speak five or six languages. Um, they, they have to study Hebrew as their mother tongue, and they study Arabic, and they study English, of course. And besides those three languages, they also have optional courses such as Spanish, Russian, Chinese, and like France. Like many of them speak like five or six languages on average. It just like blows my mind. And when I ask them, isn't it hard? Like, how do you have time to learn all those languages? They say that they they really enjoy learning languages and. Um, they don't see learning a new language as a burden to them. Instead, they see it as an opportunity, as something really valuable to them that can bring them so many benefits. And I think that's one of the secrets why the Jewish population is so like successful nowadays. Yeah, I think learning a language is not that hard because you know, like the technology, like with the development of technology, it's really easy for one. For example, you can just type how to learn Mandarin or how to learn English on YouTube, and you can get a video on, like, that sheds a light on how to learn the basic grammar or basic vocabularies. I think um, when there's a will, there's a way, and especially in modern times when everything becomes so easy and so accessible. So I think, yeah, learning Chinese may not be that difficult compared to before. Mm. Now so suppose compared. suppose I, I do this. Suppose I immerse myself here in uh, some a school, uh, maybe a language school, maybe a, maybe a high school or a college, and I become conversational in Mandarin. Okay, and I also I've I've watched this show. I've watched you guys. I've watched Russell. I listen to you, and I say, gee, I I have to use my Mandarin. I have to go to China. Okay, so I take off. I get on a plane. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I can't take Aloha Airlines. Uh, I guess I would have to take Hawaiian Airlines. Uh, I get on a plane. I go to China. I go to Beijing. I get right there in the room with you. What can you do for me in terms of getting me placed in a job with my Mandarin? Do I have a career? Can somebody help me? What would I do? Uh, Jay, you know, it's interesting that you bring that with your skills as a lawyer, understanding law. Uh, your command of Mandarin and your excellent command of English, you'll probably be very highly sought to work with maybe some of these Chinese state-owned enterprises 
that are going abroad. We're seeing a phenomenon because many Chinese companies are going abroad. So they'll probably hire you as first a teacher to teach a contract course in a state-owned enterprise. Then they'll hear it in English. And then they'll understand, oh, you speak Chinese. As you improve your Chinese, you become trusted. You become into their culture. And you may find opportunities working with the CEO and the management team on how to go abroad, how to do the business abroad. So there's infinite possibilities. But I think the most important thing is you have to start this crossroad with language, culture. When you both share language and culture, you come to a crossroad where you can share a friendship and have a shared vision. Yeah, and don't so forget the food, the by the way. That portal. Don't forget food, Russell. Don't forget food. Yes, food. Food helps. And, and yeah. And, and I'm sure that many Americans coming here will find that Chinese food is, is probably a lot different than in the U.S. Okay, one and last question I have to ask you guys, okay? So, you know, Irene and Will, um, at some point you're going to finish school. Irene, you're going to finish, you're going to have a law degree, maybe you'll want to take a master's, who knows what. And Will, you're going to finish in international studies, you're going to understand international studies, which to me is so important. The two of you will be well positioned, okay? What will you do, I mean, if anything, to come to Hawaii? What role do you see in building the bridge? Is there a bridge to be built? Russell feels there is. Is there a bridge to be built? And how will you guys, as a lawyer and as someone skilled in international relations, how will you participate in building the bridge? Building the bridge. That is the challenge of the future. Well, how I would do it would be, we already have so many Chinese tourists coming over to Hawaii, and on Hawaiian Airlines, unfortunately, there's no business class in their aircraft from Beijing to Hawaii. And one way we could encourage them to change that, to provide that business class, to encourage the business-seeking class to come from China to Hawaii, would be to, as Russell said, start learning the language and open the door. Literally, using the language is building the bridge. And when you're building that bridge, then the rest of it falls into place. You start getting more materials. You start getting more capital coming in just because of the language, the door. That is essentially the blueprint for the bridge. Mm -hmm. Irene, how do you and feel I about this? We're almost out of time. So Irene, how do you feel about this? Um, um, personally, I'm going to study in like U.S. law school for my like for my like for the JD program, and I think um, there are so many people nowadays in China. They want to expand their business in like foreign soil, but just because they don't know the local culture or they don't speak the language, they are afraid of doing so because they might get into trouble and they don't know how to solve it. I think studying law is actually helping me to actually help them in the future because when they are getting into some trouble or in a loss too, I can just, because I know the US culture and Chinese culture, I can combine those two and actually help them to deal with the situations they are in. And with that, with that, with that, like, um, like afraid mentality gone, I think it will be so much easier for anyone to invest or to expand their business in foreign soil. And, and I think international lawyer is like so important nowadays and they're like really in desperate demand. Well, I hope you like join us again, Irene. We want to talk more about international law, but for now I'm going to ask Russell to close. Russell, you're the co-host. This is your opportunity to close. You have one minute. Hi, Jay. I've, I've said this for about 20, 30 years. We need to make Hawaii friendlier to the Chinese. We know the tourists are coming. But what are we doing to wrapping up capabilities? We need to have more language ability. We need to have more Hawaiians being able to speak Mandarin. It opens culture, friendships. If we did it with the Japanese, we can do it with the Chinese. The second largest economy in the world. We need to get up to the global standard. We need to get up in the global stream of doing business. This yeah. is the only way to do it. As you say, and the best way that Hawaii can remain relevant is to learn the language and stay in touch with China. And I hope that in our lifetimes we will see a great bridge. And we're looking to you two guys, you two charming guys, Irene Lee and Will Ladd, to help us do that. We're counting on you. We want to talk to you again. Thank you so much, Russell. Thank you, Irene. Thank, Thank you, Will. Aloha, Chai Jin, Xie Xie.